Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I get the rather dubious honor of following Bill Gates with my talk. So let's just hope I can do a good job of it. All the talks tonight, by the way, have been absolutely brilliant, and I hope I can continue that trend. And speaking of trends, I think one thing that's really important to note, which is a positive thing, is that in the last 30 years of cancer research, we've doubled the 10-year survival rate of patients. And that is testimony to the quality of the research that the scientific community is doing. However, this trend does not follow suit for advanced cancers and for difficult to treat cancers, such as pancreatic cancer. So what are we missing? Well, there's what I would call the cancer conundrums, which is an inordinate set of questions, some of which we can answer well, some of them we can't answer very well currently. And I think the missing link to a lot of these questions is evolution. Now, when people think of evolution, they would typically think of the evolution of human beings, and they'd be reasonable to think so. But actually, evolution is a natural system that plays into many things. For example, when I moved to London, there seems to be an evolutionary selection going on of its own. But in seriousness, evolution is driven by DNA mutations. DNA mutations enact physical changes to creatures. And this is exactly what happens in cancer. We can see physical changes that happen down the microscope. And these are driven by DNA mutations from normal colonic tissue to cancer tissue. But how do we know this? How do we know that genetics is the driving force behind cancer? Well, there are lots of experiments that have been done recently, including this one by Thurwell. And they've actually sequenced the DNA of different regions of cancer. And they can see that there are DNA mutations present but they can also see, importantly, that there are different DNA mutations present in different regions of the cancer. So cancer is not one homogenous thing. Cancer is not one disease. Cancer is not something that we can just pin a name to. Cancer is not homogenous. Cancer is heterogeneous, and it is made up of clones. Clones is a rather confusing term, but actually all it means is that the genetic information that you saw earlier, that we have different clones, we have different mutations driving the cancer. So how does this affect our current understanding of chemotherapy and radiotherapy? Well, at the moment, the chemotherapies that we might use for patients select for clones. So we can actually shrink our model cancer by giving this patient different chemotherapies. But in a lot of cases, particularly in advanced cancers, we're always left with a minimum residual disease. We're left with a small amount of cells that we just can't remove. So the question is, well, what happens next? Well, in some cases, we're going to have remission. In some cases, we're going to have relapse. And the really important thing to note here is that when we get relapse, we now have a different disease to what we started with. Evolution continues. It doesn't stop once we have remission. These particular clones, we may not be able to treat this time round, which is why we get problems treating advanced cancer. So there are two very important implications of evolution in cancer. One of them is that if we target the cells directly, it's a moving target, where it's always going to be difficult to control cancer evolution. Conventional therapies actually promote resistance in a lot of cases through this selection mechanism that we've just seen. So what else can we do? Well, there's many things we can do. But one of the most recent research topics is ecological therapy. Now, to understand ecological therapy, we have to think of cancer differently. We can't just think of it as this homogenous entity. We have to think of it as an ecosystem. What do we mean by an ecosystem? Well, here's an ecosystem. This is a woodland. This is a cancer, and this is an ecosystem. This has got different cells that populate it, that interact in a habitat. And the habitat is the key here. The habitat of the woodland is the tree. The habitat of this cancer is the microenvironment. So if it's a bowel cancer, the bowel microenvironment. So let's go through an example of an ecological therapy before we talk about what we could do with cancer, with two other pests that I'm sure we'd like to see less of in London. Pigeon and the girl. 
Now, the pigeon and the gull are in equilibrium, generally speaking, because they live off of the habitat that we provide for them. Now, if we culled pigeons, if we removed some of these easier birds, we would invoke something called competitive release. The population of gulls would increase because we've enabled them to have access to more food. The easier thing to do here to control this population and an ecological approach would be to target their environment. They can only survive in the environment that we give them. They're verminous creatures. So strategy one would be do not feed the birds. Strategy two would be keep London tidy, which I'm sure we could all do. So what about a specific example with cancer? There's something called hypothermia. Now, hypothermia is this idea that alongside conventional therapies, we can actually heat the environment of the cancer. We can control the environment. And we can do this in a number of ways. We could do whole body, or we could direct it. And there's actually studies that are going on at the moment to actually see how effective these are. And some of them are actually very, very positive, particularly in gliomas, brain cancers, that are hard to operate on. But why does this work? We think, well... Heating a cancer, that sounds like something from Star Trek. That sounds like science fiction. Why does this work? Well, we don't need TFL to tell us what happens when we get hot or too hot. We feel nauseous. We feel ill. Now, cancer cells come from ordinary cells in our body, and they have some of the same vulnerabilities that our normal cells have, which is why, in this context, this doesn't seem so unreasonable. But what about other ecological therapies? Well, anti-angiogenesis drugs are another. Angiogenesis is the process of a larger cancer gaining blood vessels, and it needs blood to grow, the same as normal cells do. Anti-angiogenesis drugs block this process. We're not attacking the cells directly, we're cutting off their blood supply. Immune system stimulation is another. Immune system stimulation works particularly well for leukemias, where we can actually use antibodies to tag cancer cells. Thus, our own immune system can actually do the hard work for us, and we, don't even, we may not even need to use chemotherapy if this was improved. So, back to the original question. Can we increase cancer survival through understanding evolution, but also through, as well as understanding, bringing a counteraction to it? We already are, and I think we can. And I think over the next few decades of research, there's going to be lots of improvements to cancer therapy by taking into account evolution and, for example, using ecological therapies. I'll just leave you with one last little story. When I was young, I used to go down to Western Supermare, and I used to play a game called Whack-A-Mole. I'm sure lots of you have heard of Whack-A-Mole. The idea is that you use the hammer and you keep the moles down. This, in my mind, is a lot like cancer. The chemotherapy is the hammer. The moles are the cancer. But instead of, if the objective of this game is to keep the moles down, there may be another way that we can play this game. I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you.